Hey, it's Jim, and this is level one of the CFA program, the topic on alternative investments, and the learning module on alternative investment features, methods, and structures. This is truly an introductory learning module, and we're going to treat it as such, as you'll see in this relatively short slide deck. Over the next six or seven learning modules, however, we'll get into great details. But in the simplicity of this first learning module, let me go ahead and give you kind of my definition of alternative investments and what it means for the level one of the CFA program. If I asked you to close your eyes and envision an equity security, you'll probably think of things like dividends, You'll think of executive leadership team. You'll think of things like positive net present value traded on an, an organized exchange or uh, an over-the-counter market. In other words, equity securities have similar features, right? If I asked you to close your eyes and think about fixed income securities, you think about coupon payments and you think about uh, a principal payment. You might think about uh, interest rate risk and default risk, but fixed income securities, they all have their own kind of similar features. There's a great Melissa Etheridge song called uh, Similar Features that you guys ought to listen to from back in the old days. But alternative investments, uh, there are no similar features. In fact, I want you just to think of alternative investments or any kind of an investment vehicle that doesn't fit into fixed income and uh, equity securities. So there we go. Features and categories, investment ownership and compensation structure. And then probably the most interesting part of this first learning module is this concept of direct and co-investment and fund investment. In fact, I think that's probably uh, where the focus ought to be in this introductory learning module, because when we get to those six or seven subsequent learning modules, we're really going to dive into not just the mathematics of, you know, compensation and returns, but we're going to get into way more, way more breadth and way more depth. depth. So here we go. Typical introductory slide that we have. What are alternative investments? Well, there we go. What did I just say? This means that they fall outside the traditional equity securities, fixed income securities, and then whatever money market securities you can throw in. So here's just three quick examples, private capital, real assets, and hedge funds. But what you'll see over the next six or seven learning modules is that we'll have uh, different discussions on these three, but then some others as well. So here's a good question for the exam. You know, why are, why are we interested in doing this? Well, if you go back and think of about what you can earn by investing in fixed income securities, right? You get the income, you get the coupon payments, and you have a yield to maturity. But remember, there's all different sorts of ways to measure that kind of return. But you're kind of limited with fixed income securities because of the maturity value uh, that's locked into that $1,000, right? When you think of equity securities, you know, you think of dividends and you think of capital appreciation. I mean, you could clearly buy a share stock at 10 and sell it for, you know, 10,000 or $20,000. So there's unlimited upside potential. You can only lose whatever you invest. And recall our really, really good conversations on correlation coefficient, standard deviation and variance. Well, what are we trying to do here? <clears throat> what we're simply trying to do is add securities to the portfolio, in this case, alternative securities, that will continue to lower the standard deviation of the portfolio. However, however, the idea here is that not only are we going to reduce risk, we're going to increase our expected return. So think about that Harry Markowitz efficient frontier, right? That little curve. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to take our hands and we're trying to push up towards that left top corner. We want to get less return, right? Diversification. We want to get more expected return. And so that's that second uh, box point there. Improve portfolio risk return profile. I think if you, if you um, just think of Harry Markowitz and trying to add alternatives into his equity universe and then the fixed income universe on the vertical axis, I think you'll be able to get the sense of where this fits into, you know, modern portfolio theory going all the way back to the 1950s with Harry Markowitz. Now, that final box point, I think, is a really good potential exam question. So 
what do we know? We know that in the last you know, 20 or 30 years or so. And of course, just forget about the, you know, the early 2020s, you know, we had a super low interest rate environment. So the idea here is that even when interest rates are low, that we can pursue alternative investments and then increase our increase our return. That third box point is coupled, it's coupled with the second box point. However, notice that the important part of that sentence is the low interest rate period. So look for that in the question stem. It'll give you the idea of looking at just, you know, moving up on the vertical axis in the Harry Markowitz world rather than worrying so much about the horizontal axis. All right, how about some features of these alternative investments. What do we know? We know if we invest in a bond, we're going to get interest. If we invest in a share of stock, we might get a dividend, but sooner or later that company is probably going to pay us a dividend. Well, what do we and what do we get if we invest in uh, some type of an alternative investment? So these are specialized. Uh, these are this requires specialized knowledge to be able to value the cash flows and the risks. I mean, think about investing in some kind of an alternative investment. And I'll give you the example. Maybe, maybe you've heard me say this before. Years and years ago, after that great James Bond movie came out, Casino Royale, which, by the way, my wife and I just watched on TV last night. Um, there's a scene where James Bond comes out of the uh, comes out of the ocean or wherever he is, and he's got this, you know, kind of a skimpy bathing suit. And for kicks and giggles, I typed in James Bond bathing suit on eBay. Now this is 2007 or 2008, and there it was, the James Bond swimming suit, eighteen thousand dollars. And I thought, man, that's a great alternative investment. So I point this out to my students, and you know, we talk about. Uh, Hollywood movie memorabilia, but how do you value? I have no idea what that thing is worth today. You know, how many years ago was that? Uh, you know, it's uh, nearly 20 years ago. And so, what are what are we saying? If I paid 18,000 for that two decades ago, what would it be worth today? Would it be worth 9,000 or would it be worth a million dollars? I mean, whatever it is, how do you value? There are no cash flows. How do you value that? How do you value the risks? Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. So there's, uh, there's that need for specialized knowledge. And then of course, that specialized knowledge, it directly relates to the need to be able to compute and understand what that correlation coefficient is between, let's say, the James Bond swimming suit and a share of Johnson & Johnson stock. So let me just go back here real quick. What did we say? Why alternative investments? Diversification. Let me just remind you that the reason we get that extra diversification is because there's low correlation between all of these investment, uh, alternative investments and fixed income securities and, uh, and equity securities. I would have no idea what the correlation coefficient between uh, movie memorabilia and a share of Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson. I mean, I could guess it's probably close to zero, but who knows, it might be a minus uh, 0.4. Now, what I was just describing there leads into that third diamond point. <clears throat> of course, if I buy this James Bond swimming suit, can I sell it tomorrow? I mean, I might. I'd have to list it somewhere and nobody might be interested in it. So absolute less liquidity in the uh, alternative investment universe, way longer investment horizons, and then a large capital outlay. Of course, 18000 is not too much for a, a large capital outlay. I wouldn't want you to think about that. But if we want to get into a hedge fund, we, we might need $5 million. <clears throat> so those different uh, features up top, they lead to super extra challenges, right? If we want to know about Microsoft or AT&T, or Procter and Gamble. I mean, all we really need to do is go to Yahoo Finance or any other search and just figure it out. And somebody will have done all this extra work for us, and we can at least get our get our feet wet in trying to figure out how to value that particular security. But how do you value Hollywood movie movie memorabilia? How do you value an apartment building? How do you value a hedge fund? You know, so this is really really complex. And then what you have to figure out is how do you pay some kind of a fund manager for doing all of this stuff. And then how do you uh, how do you appraise not only the asset itself if it's if it's like the James Bond swimsuit or uh, how do you evaluate the performance, right? Suppose I'm a 
hedge fund manager and you send me a hundred dollars and I turn it into two hundred dollars uh, in a week well I'm gonna come back and say I'm a genius right and you're gonna say hey you know what Jim if you could repeat that every week uh, I won't need you for much longer but then suppose after the next week I turn it back down to a hundred dollars well then what so what did you pay me that first week and then do I have to pay you back during that second week because right at the beginning of the first week it was a hundred and at the end of the second week it's it's still a hundred and you're out all that compensation that you paid me after that first week. So there's super challenges. Now here's a preview of these future learning modules. We'll talk about uh, this whole private universe. We'll talk about real assets. There's an entire learning module on natural resources. Uh, there's one on infrastructure. There's one on real estate. Notice down at the bottom, there are others, uh, fine art patents digital assets there's one at the very end on digital assets and then uh, and then of course hedge funds so let's just quickly go through some of these definitions i'm guessing that you probably know some of this stuff um, this will be re-emphasized when we get to that learning module on private uh, capital in the future but for now you know just think about these as uh has you know some kind of a fund manager let's just suppose i'm jim and i say you know what you guys send me all your money you know send me but don't send me ten dollars or don't even send me eighteen thousand dollars send me ten million dollars so i'll raise all this money you know suppose i have a billion dollars and what i'll do is i'll go out and i'll try to find privately held companies and i'll go and i'll buy these privately held companies either their debt or their equity i'll make them a loan right or i'll go buy the a portion of their company um, and then the other part, and this might be a good exam question, is that I can do some research on a publicly held company that has interest in uh, in becoming private. You know, back in the old days, um, you know, these were called management buyouts and leverage buyouts, even though those terms still still um, are appropriate. It's usually under the uh, the terminology of of private equity. Real assets, um, we can do this either directly or indirectly. Commercial real estate debt, commercial real estate equity, any kind of things that you think about. You might remember that in a previous learning module, uh, for some reason, and this goes back to my childhood, uh, when my family would go to the beach, and my favorite thing was swimming in the ocean, but my nearly favorite thing was playing miniature golf. So when I think of investing in real assets, for some reason, I just think of uh, investing in all of the miniature golf courses at the beach because they're always, always super crowded. Now, it could be almost anything. I have an acquaintance who, uh, who has purchased over the years apartment buildings, commercial buildings, but he has also purchased buildings that, are, uh, that he leases to the federal government, like post offices. Uh, so there's all different sorts of things in, in that real, uh, the real asset, real estate category. Uh, infrastructure, you know, so roads and schools and airports. Remember our conversation back in fixed income securities where we had a conversation on uh, municipal bonds. And so lots of times you'll have a municipality issue a bond and that bond will say something like, hey, you know what, we're going to go ahead and build this bridge. And what we're going to do is we're going to charge a toll for people to go over the bridge. So there's a natural repayment of the bond issue and what happens then is there can be this union between the local municipality and some kind of a public entity which then would be coupled with some kind of a private like a con like a construction company who was going to go ahead and uh, and build that uh, build that bridge or an airport or a mall or whatever it is Natural resources, the Institute is very big on dividing these into three categories. We'll have a future learning module on this, commodities, uh, land for both farming and for forestry. And then down at the bottom, other assets, so art collectible items. There's my James Bond example. Isn't the James Bond example much more exciting than, than uh, stamps? At least it is to me. Although coins, you guys ever watch that great movie, The Deep? Uh, this was a long, long time ago where they, uh, they found some coins in a, in a, a ship that was uh, crashed at sea. Oh man, super tense, really great acting in that movie. 
intangible assets, patents, and litigation. Let me just remind you, we had great conversations in our financial statement analysis conversations about uh, those intangible assets. So they're a pl I think take all that knowledge that we had from that previous learning module and throw it into this one as well. And then there'll be an entire learning module on digital assets. The hedge fund universe goes back to 1949 with a dude named uh, A.W. Jones, and he was just like me. He said, hey, send me your money, but, but send me $5 million. And, you know, I'm not going to invest in fixed income securities. I'm not going to invest in equity securities. I'm going to invest in whatever I want to invest in. And so the hedge fund universe is really identical to the mutual fund universe with the, with the distinguishing uh, difference is that the manager can do pretty much whatever he or she wants. Now, of course, it has to, it has to be in the prospectus. It has to say something like, look, look at some of those bullet points. I'm going to invest in derivatives. I'm going to do short selling. I'm going to use leverage. I'm going to do anything that I want to do as long as it's inside of, uh, of the prospectus. And by the way, um, this dude, A.W. Jones, what he did in 1949 sounds pretty silly today, but back then this was revolutionary. What he did is said, you know what, I'm going to start borrowing money and I'm going to use that to buy shares of stock and I'm going to short sell. So that was pretty much the first hedge fund. And it has evolved, of course, expanded to include anything out there. Look, publicly traded fixed income assets, private capital, real estate, including miniature golf courses hedge funds. All right. So what happens here? An investor contributes capital to a fund, right? So you guys would send me each $5 million or $10 million. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify, and let me go back here quickly. I'm going to identify these publicly or privately or real estate. I'm going to, or the James Bond swimsuit. I'm going to invest in all of these kinds of things and I'm not going to do it for free. I'm going to do it uh, for a fee, and that fee is probably not going to be embedded like it is in the mutual fund universe where the, the manager of the fund you know, might get a 1% fee or a half percent fee or something like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say something like, look, if I turn my your $100 into $200, I want a fee. Sure, you can pay me 1% or 2%, but I want to be compensated for that extra 98 or 99% that I provided with you. Now, what did I say a while ago? Of course, this makes this compensation structure way more, way more complex. All right, so what are the advantages? These are good questions here. You get my investment service and my expertise. You don't have to worry about anything. You just send me your money and I'll do all the stuff. Um, lower minimum capital requirements um, for fund investment, lower than in direct investment. You know, like if you're going to go out and buy a whole bunch of miniature golf courses, you might need a couple, uh, 10 or 20 or $30 million, whatever it is. Uh, disadvantages, of course, you're going to have to pay me and then uh, you're going to have to do a lot of research on who I am and what my record is and can you really trust me. I mean, that's pretty much what it comes down to when uh, when evaluating a hedge fund manager. I say this to my students all the time, even when I when I have conversations about companies like Procter & Gamble or Johnson & Johnson. You know, when you buy a bond or you buy a share of stock, you're essentially just trusting the executive leadership team and the board of directors. But in the investing in debt or equity securities, you know, you have a whole bunch of people on your side, a whole bunch of people on your team, like the board of directors, like the SEC, like the entire uh, financial institution industry. Sometimes it works and most of the time it works in your favor. Some, sometimes it doesn't. But here, when you're involved, when you're investing in um, a hedge fund, you, you, you don't have all those people on your side. I mean, you do to some extent, but not nearly the amount. All right, how about this concept of co-investment? So this is what's happening here. I'll say something like here, send me your money, send me $5 million, and I'll go invest in a diversified portfolio of these alternatives. And then, oh, by the way, over here, I'm gonna invest in this, uh, a bunch of miniature golf courses at the beach, and I'm gonna give you 
a chance to go ahead and make another investment that would go directly into miniature golf courses. So your original investment, right? The, the original investment would be, you're just gonna invest in me, I got all these assets here. But then you can do this extra, it's almost like an option. You can co-invest by directly in some of those same uh, advantage, some of those same alternative advantages. And what that, I'm sorry, alternative investments. So what that does then is that gives you um, the idea of, you know what, if you know something about miniature golf courses or you want to know something about miniature golf courses, well, then this is your chance to do it, right? Now, with co-investment, you have reduced management fees and allows for more active, in, uh, active management, as I just mentioned. Reduced control, higher oversight costs, and more active involvement. Those things make sense here. So what, why, why do we do this? Why do we want to choose one or more co-investors? So it allows for expansion of investment opportunities. I say this to you kind of regularly. In the academic world, we call that spanning, right? So spanning necessarily gives the investor more choices, and it probably increases diversification. And then what it does to, uh, it speeds up that, uh, that investment cycle. Now, like my acquaintance, you could just directly invest in a post office without an intermediary. You could do this uh, as much as you want. Of course, you could have a lot of money. I mean, you, you could go to your local municipality and say, you know what, I think there should be a bridge from here over to there. And you could go ahead and build it yourself. I mean, you probably have to get, you know, some zoning approvals and all sorts of other kind of crazy things. And you're probably not likely to do that unless you're a construction company. But of course, you know, you can do you can make all these kinds of investments on your own. What this means is you have, don't have to worry about all those management fees. You have lots and lots of flexibility and more control, but then uh, it's probably going to cost you more and you probably need to know something about, uh, about building bridges. All right, so back in my uh, back to my example, I'm going to go ahead and be the general partner. So you guys send me all your money, right? I use some of my money, right? I run the business. I have unlimited liability. You're the limited partners. You guys play a passive role. You're known as the accredited investors, accredited investors, which means that you went ahead and read the prospectus. You know, I'm not just investing in Procter and Gamble and a treasury bond. I'm investing in uh, all sorts of things out there and I'm doing it for your benefit, right? The benefit is what? Greater uh, risk return profile and low correlation coefficients. <clears throat> Now here's some good uh, some good definitions that show up at the questions at the end of this learning module. The limited partnership agreement, you can imagine what that looks like, right? So the relationship between me and you depends on this agreement, which will have things in there that sound something like, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do this, and if it pays off, then I'm gonna distribute this uh, this extra capital or this earned capital to you guys. Now, I know that each one of you out there is going to have your own kind of bias, your own kind of interest, your own kind of agenda. So you're going to call me privately and you're going to say, hey, you know what, Jim, how about if this happens? So these are side letters, side agreements between um, a limited partner or, or a group of limited partners. And so one of the skills that I have to have is to try to figure out how to go ahead and uh, craft these side agreements so that it benefits you, it benefits me, and it doesn't hurt all those other limited partners that are not part of that side letter. And it might be something as simple as the, let's go back to my example. All right, I turn $100 into $200, so everyone's happy, but yeah, some of you have a side letter that says, hey, you know what, if Jim ever doubles our money, I get another 2% or something like that. Uh, I sure hope I wouldn't sign that side letter, but you know, you get this different kinds of compensation agreements uh, or different timing of those distributions. And there's a master limited partnership. Uh, other common adopted structures here, this public private partnership, this is a, uh, this could be just a regular old partnership. It could be a joint venture. Uh, common between construction companies and municipalities who are building things like bridges and tunnels. But we'll have an entire learning module on that one. All right, let's go ahead and finish up this with a little bit of math. 
let's start with a couple of definitions here. We have this management fee. A lot of times it's called a base fee. We need to worry about the difference between uh, this fee, which is based on assets under management or committed capital. So this is super important. It's a great exam question that the assets under management would be, you know, some big number like a billion dollars where I'm actually managing one billion dollars worth of assets, but committed capital. And this is typically with private equity. You guys might say to me, all right, Jim, here's five million dollars. So I'm I'm managing, let's say, one hundred million dollars. But over the next three or five or maybe seven years, I don't know that it would go out to 10 years, you guys have committed to another 80 million or 200 million. You've committed that capital in the future. And so uh, we're going to base my performance on your committed capital, right? One to two percent is pretty common. So we can have performance fees, we can have carried interest, which has tremendous political kinds of uh, conversations. We'll talk about that length at some other date. The Institute doesn't emphasize that in this learning module as well. So these things are based on excess returns. So what was that? 100, 100, what did I turn? 100 into 200. So that's 100%. Well, that sounds like an excess return no matter what, but we need to figure out what is it exceeding. I mean, you could come to me and say, hey, no, Jim, I expect you to earn 98%. And so I'm like, oh boy, okay, I'll earn that. So if I double your money, that's 100%. So your excess compensation, your excess return will only be 2% in that uh, in that silly example. So we need to do, worry about hurdle rates, right? That hurdle rate, maybe it's 8%, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 12%. So there's a hard hurdle rate, which is the 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 GP earns those returns above that hurdle rate. But then there's a, a soft hurdle rate, which is a little bit more complex. And I'll show you that here in just a second. A couple of extra definitions, this, uh, this catch up clause, 100% uh, of performance fees based on returns above that hurdle rate. And then whatever is over top of that, that split, <clears throat> you know, so if I go from $100 to $200 and the, uh, hurdle rate is 10%. Well, I'll get all that. Uh, I'll get all that. And then what will happen is that the other 90% will be distributed. Maybe it's 90, 10, maybe it's 80, 20, maybe it's 75, 25, whatever it is. High watermark, suppose that I go from 100 to 200, right? And then the next year I go down to 50. Well, you paid me from the 100 to the 200, right? Now it's all the way down to 50. So that high watermark is set now at 200. So there's not going to be this uh, performance fee until until I get that fund back up over, over the 200. Waterfall, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about that side letter. So without side letters, the waterfall, what happens? You know, you go like this and then it spills over and it spills over. So this determines what uh, what does that allocation look like? And then there's that clawback clause that gives the uh, the limited partners the right to reclaim. You know, so if I go from 100 to 200 and you guys pay me a whole bunch and then I go down to 50, well, you can say, you know what, Jim, you kind of stink. So we need some of that money back. Let's do. Uh, let's just do a quick example here. Here's some good equations. Uh, <clears throat> there's the return for uh, the GP. It's the max of zero, right? Zero meaning that I don't get anything, and then uh, R minus RH. R is that fund's uh, rate of return for that period, and then the H stands for the hurdle rate. And then if we have that catch-up provision, we'll go ahead and subtract out a couple of other things in the denominator. Uh, let's just do just a quick example here. 20% performance fee, 8% hurdle rate. Um, <clears throat> suppose the fund receives a 12% period for the return. Let's do this uh, return with and without. And so there's a... Uh, uh, what do we get? We earn 12. There's the hurdle rate of eight. So 12 minus eight, that's four. So 20% of four gives me... Uh, 0.8, there's my uh, fees. Suppose then there's this catch-up clause. Uh, suppose it's 0.8%. So let's go ahead and just do the math down at the bottom. And uh, there you get 1.44%. And that takes us through our learning outcomes. There are eight good questions. Uh, I covered most of those inside of this learning module recording. So you ought to be able to get 
through those in uh, in less than 10 minutes or so. Just focus on the uh, focus on all the definitions. So hey, thanks for watching and have a great day and good luck studying.